Acts 27, verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have, been, you would have avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand before trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. About midnight, we we're on the, on the 14th night of the storm. As we were being driven across the Sea of Adria, the sailors' sense land was near. They dropped the weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the soldiers tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, You will all die unless the soldiers stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't touched food in two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own strength, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke, it off, broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. All 276 of us who were on board. After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. When the morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could go get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised their foresail, and headed toward shore. But they hit a shoal and, their, and, the, and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship struck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. He ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held on to planks and debris from the broken ship. So everyone escaped safely to shore. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. But the people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to one each other, A murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when, he had waited a long, when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. I'm going to skip down to verse 11. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered in the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods as its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we sailed across to Regium. A day later, the south wind began blowing, so the following day, we sailed up the coast to Putoli. There, we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard that we were coming, and they came out to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. So as we read through um, Paul there, as you can well imagine, um, that his life would probably make, in a lot of ways, even just that stuff, would, would make a pretty, pretty interesting movie. And you may have met people whose lives you kind of wonder, wow, I mean, if the story could be told, it would be something else. Well, today, of course, in Acts 27 to 28, we see Paul escaping death and by several things, by storm, by soldiers that were thinking to kill him, by shipwreck, by even a poisonous snake. And through it all, he's courageous. He trusts in God because God had promised him that he would make it to Rome. And he just believed that's, well, that's what God said. That's what's going to happen. 
So as we go through this account, we're going to see how also how we can legitimately trust God in our lives for whatever we are facing, even though we are not the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul has been in Roman custody at this point for over two years. Um, He's been heard in trials numerous times by different Romans authorities who kept just putting him off. They wouldn't make any kind of decision. Finally, he appealed his case to Caesar, to the emperor, and he's on his way, basically, by, by ship to Rome. Now, in the largest story of the book of Acts, what Paul is fulfilling is what Jesus said that his followers would do. It's the theme of the book of Acts. Acts 1.8, he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And God had put in Paul's heart, in his inmost desire, that he wanted to go to the center of the known world at that point, to Rome, to bring uh, the message of Jesus to the heart of the Roman Empire. And that was in his heart for a long time. Back in Acts 19, it says, Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. After that, he said, I must go on to Rome. He had that in his heart a long time. And after Paul, when he went to Jerusalem, he became in Roman custody. And Jesus appeared to Paul and told him that uh, the goal of that situation, being in custody, was that he would still end up in Rome. Acts 23, 11. That night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul, just as you have been a witness to, to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. So this reassurance from Jesus to Paul, in spite of the circumstances of being imprisoned, Um, showed that God's purpose was even in that situation and that the good news of Jesus would go forth to more people. So Paul put his trust in what Jesus told him and he carried on. So today here in Acts 27 to 28, we see God's sovereign hand as he works through one thing after another that should have either stopped or killed Paul, preventing him from fulfilling God's purpose. But God's purposes are never thwarted. God brings Paul through, just as he said he would. I heard this quote this week. David Livingston was a famous African missionary from the 1800s. And this explorer, Henry, Henry Stanley, found him at one point and says, David Livingston, I presume. You may be familiar with that. Well, David Livingston said, A man or woman is immortal until their work is done by God. God will not let... Um, he, we're, he's only done when God is done. And that's how it is for all people who follow Jesus. And of course, we're seeing this in Paul's life as we go through this account. So Paul is on his way to Rome, and it's quite a trip. So we're going to look at it in stages. Caesarea to Fair Havens will be stage one. And uh, verses one and two of ch- verse t- chapter 27 it says, When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adramidium on the northern coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at the ports along the coast of the province. So, here's a little map for you of this stage of the journey. Down below on the the right side is where they start from... uh, Caesarea, then they're going to make a stop in Sidon, then they'll go up around Crete, end up in a place called Myra, where they're going to actually get onto another ship, and then continue on to the island there of uh, Crete, um, where they, ha- they sort of um, basically end up in a place called Fair Havens. So the trip begins, and now even though Paul is a prisoner, it's interesting, he's allowed traveling companions. We get named this guy from Macedonia. And there's a we, and that is the author of the book of Acts. That's Luke. Luke himself, the one who is writing this account, is with Paul. And you can see that as we go through. There's definitely, this is a first-hand account of what went on. That's because the author was right there. We'll skip down to verse 5. So they're traveling. It says, Keeping to the open sea, we passed along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. There, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. So from Myra, they had, from then on down to Crete, 
they had very hard sailing with contrary winds and finally made it to that place, Fair Havens, which is a port on the island of Crete. Verse 9, he says, We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. And Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Now, right about this time of year, it's probably about that time of year that they were talking there, or even November. And that is a very stormy part of the time of the year with strong winds. And generally, shipping just sort of stopped. Wherever your ship was, you would just hole up somewhere in some harbor until it was safe, until it was spring, basically. And Paul, and they wanted to do that. Uh, but Paul, and Paul advised them against continuing. Now, his advice may not have been appreciated. He wasn't a sailor, but he was also hearing from God. He wasn't just giving his opinion. Um, but God will, will help him here. And this is what he says in verse 10. He says, men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to ourselves as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain than the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. So basically that was about 40 miles up the, the island that they were at to that harbor. But, of course, Paul warned them that they said, wow, come on, you're, what do you know? But, like I said, God would vindicate him as correct in due time. So the next stage of the journey is Fair Havens to Malta. Now, at this point, the weather really goes bad, very bad. Here's a little map. So if you can see on there, there's a little green thing up to where Phoenix is. They don't make it. They go out, and you'll see why very soon. Verse 13, when a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength, called a northeaster, burst upon the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. Now, we have seen very recently ourselves some really severe storms in the southern U.S. with huge damage. That's the kind of storm these guys are dealing with. Instead of typhoon strengths, well, in the Pacific, they're called typhoons. In the Atlantic, they're called hurricanes. Same deal. So this was a very, very severe storm. They, these, these were experienced sailors. They were doing all they could, and it wasn't enough, and they were scared. This storm was so bad, they actually started throwing cargo and equipment overboard to lighten up the ship. Now, this level of storm continued with no stop for two full weeks. Verse 21, for no one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. Sort of sounds like a I told you so talk, but he actually has a really good reason to address them. This is what he says next. He says, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. And they might be wondering, well, how would you know? For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, he says again, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Kind of like I got good news and I got bad news, but generally good news. But he's bringing, if you think about it, he's, he's actually acting like a pastor to these guys because they've been living in anxiety since this storm started. And there's just, there doesn't seem to be any hope at all. But God sent his angel to tell Paul that all would be okay. He assured him again that the goal of, of getting to Rome was going to happen. In God's goodness, he would also bring all the people on the ship safely to land. There's no doubt Paul was constantly praying for their situation and for the people. Because the, the angel said specifically, God has granted safety. So it's obviously he's granting because of his prayers. And God is showing his goodness, not just to Paul, but also to all those people on the ship. Most of whom, of course, did not follow the true God. But he was doing it in answer to prayer. So twice, Paul tells these people to take courage. Now, what's the basis of the courage? 
basically the belief that God would do just as he said he would. Paul had had God tell him directly what he was going to do. And so Paul could rely on that direct promise of God. That makes me think a little bit, well, what about us? We don't have that kind of direct um, line to God quite like that. What can we take courage in? What has God promised that we can believe him? And it, and it can be, like he said, that we can believe because it's just as he said, God will do it. There's low, so many things. The Bible is full of them. It's throughout the Bible we have all kinds of promises. I'd like to go through just a few of them that hopefully make a little sense to us. The first one is, that's probably the biggest one, is there is the promise of salvation, of rescue from our sin. That if we believe, that if we put our trust in Jesus, we can be and will be forgiven and have eternal life and be made God's children. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that's his promise. Because all people, every one of us, are in danger of perishing eternally because of our sin. We've all deliberately done wrong things and God says we deserve death for doing them. But in his incredible love, as it says there, God gave Jesus who willingly took the penalty of our sin on himself on the cross and then rose from the dead in victory over death. Everyone who believes, which is shown by turning from our sin and putting our trust in what Jesus did for us, will not perish, but will be forgiven and have eternal life. And that is a promise we can definitely hang on to. In addition to that, God promises that when we believe, we also become adopted as his children. John 1.12 but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So if you think about that, we too can say, I believe God. It will be just as he said. I've put my trust in Jesus. That means I belong to him. I am his child. And that is a pretty cool thing. So my question is to all of us is, hey, have you done that? If not, it's as simple as praying, telling Jesus you're sorry for your sin and would like him to forgive you and that you will give him your, your life to follow him. And if you ever have questions and want to talk about that or anything else, just ask me. Just talk to me. But when we know we belong to God, we can also trust him for another promise. The promise of answered prayer. Jesus speaking here says, hey, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, the, the clause there, in my name, is the key thing. What, is, what does that mean? Basically, in my name means that we pray according to His will, to the will of Jesus, according to what Jesus would actually want. How would Jesus want me to be praying in my situation? That doesn't mean we don't ask for things we do want. But that when we do ask, we ask in submission um, to God, that he will answer it in whatever way he sees best. And Jesus says, I will do it. And we can depend on that. That also means that Jesus wants to hear from us. He wants a close relationship with us. He loves us and wants to be in constant communication with us. So he wants us to pray. He wants us to ask. And he says, I will do it. Another thing Jesus promised is that he would always be with us in whatever is happening in our lives. Matthew 28, 20. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And there's many more verses that we could add to that. In this case, for Paul, he didn't remove him from the storm. He didn't take away the shipwreck or even the poisonous snake. But he was with Paul in all those things, bringing him through them. No one's guaranteed an easy life with no challenges. But Jesus says he will never leave us or forsake us in those times. Jesus is always with us. That gives us huge hope and assurance in this life. And we can say, hey, I believe God. It's just as he said, he is with us. God's people are also promised strength. Isaiah 40, this is some Old Testament. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. 
They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So as we trust, as we believe the Lord is with us, he also gives us strength for what we face. If you need more of that, just read through the book of Psalms as a starter. Many of them there give so much reassurance. That's why I read the psalm this morning. Um, how God gives us strength and help when we are in, in need, just like Paul was here. We can believe um, that it will be just as Jesus says, which means, like Paul was urging, we can take courage. So belief is just simply trusting God's promises that he's going to do what he said he will do. We hold on to it. We live by it. And besides here in Acts, there's other examples, of course, all through the Bible of people believing God's promises, and it makes a big difference in their lives. Abraham's a very good example as well to us. God had promised Abraham that uh, his descendants would become a great nation and that they would inhabit the land of Canaan. God gave the promise to Abraham that he would have descendants when he was 75 years old. It wasn't until he was 100 that he had Isaac, 25 years later. But Abraham hung on to that promise, and it was fulfilled. And we see this in the book of Romans. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Sounds like what Paul told the sailors, isn't it? And this is very much how he encouraged, obviously, the sailors on the ship. He said, God is able. I believe what he said, and he will do it. And as the rest of Acts, as we go finish up the book, plays out, we'll see how God is doing exactly what he said, and that Paul was right to put his trust in the Lord, and that we can do exactly the same. Another result, um, back, going back to Paul here, was that the people on the ship and along the way, they also saw God at work in powerful ways, demonstrating to many people his goodness and his grace. So yes, back to the voyage. On the 14th night of the unrelenting storm, the sailors realized they were approaching land very quickly. Being nighttime, they couldn't see the actual shore and what was there, so they put out some anchors and they waited for daylight. At that point, the soldiers, sorry, not the soldiers, the sailors, were going to try and sneak off the ship, basically abandon the ship and just leave the people there to themselves. Paul saw this, told the soldiers, and the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat, which you might think, whoa, how are you going to get off that thing? Well, they did, but that meant the sailors were going to stay on board. If the sailors had gone, there'd be no one there to run the ship. And then what? God was at work to make sure that people survived, that they all did get to shore as he had promised that they would. When it became daylight, Paul urged everybody to eat something for strength. Then then after that, they tried to get the ship to the shore, and of course, it ran aground on a reef before getting quite to the beach. And at that point, God intervened again, because at that point, the soldiers were going to said, hey, our prisoners are going to get away. Let's just kill them. And you might wonder, why would they do that? Basically, if a Roman soldier lost a prisoner, that was it for them. They would be executed. They did not want to chance that. So they thought, well, let's just kill off the prisoners, and we're going to be fine. But the centurion said, nope, we're not doing that. He wanted to save Paul. I don't know about the rest of them, but he he wanted to save Paul at least. So, So that everybody would get to shore. And so he commanded everybody, okay, everybody, let's go. Get off, get to shore, everybody, any way you could. And everybody did get off and get to shore safely by swimming or holding onto the debris from the boat or whatever. And now they're on the island of Malta. So verses 1 to 10 tells us what happens on that island. So God said they'd all get off safely. They did. Now the people of the island were really helpful once they got on the shore. And they built a fire to dry out and warm up those people from the ship. You can imagine how helpful that would be. That'd be great. And God intervened again in a miraculous way. As Paul was being very helpful, he gathered up a bunch of firewood himself and ended up collecting also a poisonous snake in the firewood, which he didn't realize, and that snake glommed onto his hand. Now, the people from the island expected Paul was going to die. They knew what that snake was. They would recognize it as a deadly snake. But again, God kept him from dying or even becoming sick. 
the people from the island were pretty amazed. I can imagine Paul was too. But he also remembered God had promised he's going to go to Rome. He's not going to die of snake bite. So right after that, a chief official from the island took Paul and some of the others, doesn't say who, into his house for three days and hosted them there. This man's father was very sick. And so what does Paul do? He heals him. And of course, everybody on the island heard about it and brought to Paul anybody who was sick. And Paul healed all of them. And you can be sure that Paul, as he was healing them, would be telling them what, uh, where this healing is coming from. He would be telling them about Jesus. So God was good. He was gracious to all these people, making himself known through Paul um, in what he was able to do by healing people and what he would have said to them. And God had all of that in his plan. He was working through what looked like errors, what looked like bad circumstances, major storms, shipwreck, snake bite. He was all being used by God to bring about his purposes and to draw people from the island of Malta to himself. It shows the truth of Romans 8.28. We quote this often, but it's so true. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We see that lived out in Paul's life. Just because things were going badly didn't mean that Paul was outside of God's will. He was in the middle of it. In the same way, we can't use circumstances to tell whether or not God, we are doing what God wants us to or not. We need to be in touch with him, listening and following his leading. He will use everything for his glory. So three months later, it was time to leave the island. And the people of the island, in gratitude for all the healing and whatever, gave Paul and his companions everything they needed for the trip. God supplied for them abundantly. So the last leg of the trip is from Malta to Rome. Now there was another ship on that island from Egypt, and they had wintered there. And they were now going to go to Italy. So they were able to hitch a ride for the last step of their journey to get to Italy. Here's where they went. Uh, so Malta's on the bottom. They go on up. They're actually quite close to uh, Italy there. They, uh, they end up in a place called uh, Putoli. If you're going to say that the Italian way is probably Putoli or I don't know. Anyway, that's where they go. And from there, they carry on overland on their trip to Rome. Verse 15. Then the brothers and sisters in Rome heard we were coming. They were traveling on land now. And they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. So all along the way, Paul could look back and see God's hand at work to bring him to that place. It was very encouraging, of course, now at this point, that there's other believers hearing that he's coming and they're welcoming him. You can bet he told them all about the trip and that he would, would have been very encouraging. And then verse 16, when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Now, having his own private lodging would be very handy as he was able to have a lot of visitors, which he's going to be doing uh, as much as he wanted, basically. Now, God had said, you're going to get to Rome and you would testify before Caesar. And there he is. He's now safely there and still telling people about Jesus. As he said to the soldiers, I believe God. It will be just as he said. To get him to that point, God had rescued Paul from a mob in Jerusalem. He rescued him from plots in there in Jerusalem as well to kill him. We saw here today that God, that he made it through a storm on a sea. He wasn't killed by the Roman soldiers or by a poisonous snake. God told people all the, sorry, God told Paul that all the people on the ship would make it safely to shore. And they did. These are all examples of how God was with Paul and protected him through everything. I hope for us that gives us confidence that in whatever situation we, can all, we are in, we can also believe God that he will do just as he said. So do you know God's promises that he gives to us as people? I've listed a few of them. He promises forgiveness, eternal life for all of us who repent and turn to put our trust in Jesus. He promises to those who believe that we will become children of God. He promises to answer our prayers as we pray according to God's will, to the will of Jesus. He promises to always be with us in the good times and bad on this earth until we are home with him in heaven. 
He promises to give us strength as we trust in him. And he promises much, much more. So keep reading your Bibles. Read right through the Old Testament and the New Testament as you can. And you will see many things that God promises to us. With these promises, we can take courage in all areas of our lives. So believe him. It's just as he said. Let's pray. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the example of Paul and what we see in his life and how he trusted you and how you, I mean, you, you came to him personally by Jesus appearing to him, by angels. But we also have your word and you give us so much truth in that, including what we're reading this morning. Thank you for the example. Thank you for what we can see and learn and understand. Help us to understand for us in our situation, in our week to come, how we can trust you. What have you promised that we can lay hold on and believe because you're the one who said it and you will do it. So apply that to our hearts. We thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you are here. In Jesus' name, amen.